Hi. <clears throat> I'm sure you're wondering, who is this character Julian, right? We're hearing so much about him, but we don't know who he is, right? And he's a very poignant character. So I'm just going to take you from the beginning of this book. Uh, I'm going to start by just reading it, the beginning, and when the slave first arrived on this plantation. <clears throat> and just kind of take you through the life of Julian as a boy. Kind of see who this character, like, person is. Uh, this is 1842. I don't think we're in Kansas anymore. The Negro slaves arrive on the Aramavish plantation. The story begins. The carriage stopped in front of the shack and the two Negro coachmen exited the carriage, walking to the rear of the cab, lifting the canopy cover. Then they unlocked the door, lowering the hood in order for the slaves to exit the door. Everybody out, life instructed the new arrivals. Mr. Aramovich, standing at five seven in height, stood directly at the back of the wagon, greeting each slave arrival as they exited from the wagon, piercing them with his light hazel eyes, giving them a superior look to mask his natural fear of their grotesqueness. Mademoiselle, madame, <laughs> he greeted, nodding his head to Sheila and Renee. Good sir, he said to Warner. Your Excellency, he said to Champion, who followed Warner. Denzelin, he said to Tendai, who was the last male to exit the wagon. Courtesan, damsel, he said to Rose, who wasn't a new arrival, but she tagged along for the new hire ride to help her master pick out the appropriate workers. Oh, stop it, sir. <laughs> you always treat me like it's my first day on the job. Rose said, hitting Mr. Aramovich on the shoulder, teasingly. Rose was one of the first Native African slaves purchased on the plantation from his childhood. The others were either sold or died due to various diseases. Though Rose was the typical super intituated mammy kind, Mr. Aramovich saw her as clever. If a person has a clever head, it's good, but it's even better if someone clever accompanies him. <laughs> For two heads is better than one. Mr. Amravitz said to Rose while signing the bill of sale for the new purchased slaves. Mr. Amravitz could never trust himself on hiring day, only relying on his carnal eye when making his selections, but never being concerned whether they were good workers or not. In his opinion, all Negroes were recalcitrant morons or insanely idiotic, even seeing the free Southern and Northern Blacks as suffering from mental defects. <laughs> Mr. Amravitz watched their necked bodies that show their sexual laxity, checking out the large buttocks on the females and the large genitals on the males, seeing them as hypersexual. Mmm, cowabunga, <laughs> he thought to himself. He would surely use them for more for copulation than his former purchased slaves to offset the fact that they died at a higher rate. Mr. Amrovich observed a white patch on the skin of Warner figuring it was either due to vitiligo or albinism, considering his male slave life, who was purchased a year prior, has a permanent mottled skin patch on his leg, but it doesn't affect his work performance, so Mr. Aramovich overlooks the physical defect, choosing to buy him despite his, its unsightliness. The weather was hot on this day, which caused Mr. Aramovich to wipe sweat off his forehead. You all should fare well in this miserable heat being that you all are pre-adapted to tropical climates, and Georgia is not only tropical, but subtropical. <laughs> Mr. Amrovitz said this to his slaves while thinking of the last two slaves, first field slaves that died of various causes due to their inadaptation to the diseases the subtropics produced. <laughs> Allow me briefly to give a reader the little background on Mr. Marian Aramovich. <clears throat> his biological parents were of were Ukrainian immigrants who fled their native country while his mother was still pregnant with him. Upon arriving in Russia, she gave birth to baby Maria in the year 1808. Being that they were poor, they were not able to take care of him, so they wrapped baby Maria in a sheet cloth, leaving him with no return address at a local orphanage. And that is all we is known about his biological parents. At the age of three years, he was adopted by a Russian Jewish family. And when Marion turned 12, his family migrated to the United States around 1820. Rose was 29 at the time, and she practically raised Marion, Mr. Marion, at the age of 17. His father took ill and later died of cardiovascular diseases, leaving Marion to take over his father's cotton business, 
a role he desired the least, having no interest in cotton farming, nor did he care to own slaves, finding the practice of race, ethnicity, and nationality policy in America harsh, considering he grew up in a raceless part of Russia and had little understanding of how it functioned. However, Mr. Aramovitz developed personal reservations about Native Africans, having developed the fear of roles that never left him. Fifteen years had passed, and the year is now 1842 and the import of Native Africans had ceased altogether after starting its decline in the 1830s. So what little tradition remained on the plantation, Mr. Marvin ensured it was surely beat out of them and replaced with salvation. And as his way of welcoming the slaves into a new program, he offered the Negroes the Bible as a new member's welcome gift. (laughs) Heroin, Mr. Aaron was greeted to another male slave whom will not be named. McGee is not a central character in the story, but only one of the many random background slaves that added to the cultural milieu. Courtesan, he said to Lorraine, who, like Rose, was also no stranger on the Aramovitz plantation. Lorraine is the daughter of Rose, but she was leased to another plantation for two years a year prior at the age of 16 in order to bear two offspring, then she would be allowed to return. Lorraine was now 17 who was now 17, was mighty happy to be back a year before her contract ended, only being on the plantation with her old master for a year, a year that was unbearably difficult. Her old master was the most brutal and cruel person and often thrashed her with a strap or whip, or he would hit her with cowhide, then cover the wound with brine so that it healed faster. And this was the straw that broke the camel's back. On her eighth month of pregnancy, he carried out the most vicious assault by making her lay in a trench to beat her, stating it was to prevent her from miscarrying his property, considering he paid Mr. Aramovich up front for the offspring. Mr. Aramovich felt it was better to have her returned immediately after he, she gave birth, feeling her owner would have surely killed her before she could give birth to the second child. She did not even have time to nurse her infant the baby being left with another pregnant female slave who nursed the abandoned infant. The condition at the plantation she resided in was deplorable to say the least. Some slaves died with genetic roots of <clears throat> some slaves died with no genetic root of their illness. Some were dying of cholera and typhoid due to the poisoned environment given the slaves antivistic behavior lorraine's master was also neglectful and mean who complained of his slaves always stalling corn and quarreling with the overseers and being that he already was wealthy he decided to sell all his slaves seeing no further benefit in sharecropping he announced that he would retire upon the sale of his property and move back to the north and that is the end of that story Everyone gather around, Mr. Amrivis instructed his new slaves in a lively fashion. He turned to Blythe, who was leaning against the back of a wagon, looking fatigued. You did swell, my heroine. Now run and heat the iron for brandy. I see a couple of bucks I would like to make my b-boy, he said, licking his lips while watching Warner and Tendai. Mr. Amrivis would brand the letter B on the skin of certain males, representing that they were available annually for male pleasure. The male's moral and social feelings were blunted, so what did it matter that they would become a b-boy? Mr. Amrivitz also would brand those reported to have displayed aggressiveness and combativeness with their former masters, so Tendai was for sure getting the b-tramp stamp and become a b-boy, being that he was the most recalcitrant of the bunch. Life, feeling fatigued, reached down to scratch his model leg, then rested on that knee that was also swollen while breathing hard as if experiencing respiratory problems. Yes, master, Life said to his master. Then he limped away to heat the iron. Mr. Aramis led the new arrivals into their living quarters while Rose held on to his arm as if being escorted into a ballroom. There used to be bushes on the plantations, but now there's trees. Rose said to the new slaves while giving Mr. Aramovich a quick smile, referring to the gentrification of slave plantations in the South. The roof of the slave quarters was covered in shingles, serving as protection from the scorching heat. The slaves walked inside, having a look around, seeing the windows draped with curtains made with flower sacks. Where my bed at? Tender eggs, <laughs> seeing no bedding. But they would either sleep on the wooden floor or straw and given a simple blanket that would not be replaced until threads were barely 
keeping their shimmering bodies warm during the night. This made sleep difficult, especially for Tendai, who breathing, whose breathing and sleep sounded harsh and cruel, making the others wake up at night, making them aggressive in the morning. Lack of sleep was the least of their problems because they existed in darkness that was oppressive, ensuring they'd never be in a state of comfort. Rose who battled with sickle cell that caused complications, triggering excruciating, painful episodes, had it difficult during sleep after the first week the new slaves arrived. She awoke during the night to find Tendai sleepwalking. Then she would guide him back inside the shack, but he never had any recollection of her watchfulness when he awoke. Rose was a stout woman, also having a swollen leg that was due to a condition known as elephantitis. It was an infection blocked circulation of limbs, causing her leg to swell a huge size, the size of an elephant leg. A former feeble male slave owned by Mr. Aronovich had the same condition and it spread to his genitals, making it hard to penetrate women due to the gigantuan size. And he later died from the infection. All the slaves loved Rose because she was a loving, sympathizing, patient, and good listener. God's will be done, she said often as a sign of piety. Rose claimed the longevity was due to prayer. I don't know what kept me living so long, Rose said of her old life, being grateful God's fights, her battles, and defeats her enemies in the war of slavery. Her unwearied toil had made her quiet in demeanor a presence even Mr. Aronovich was afraid of. She always encouraged the male slaves who complained of their long days of toiling, always wanting to give up. It ain't strength of your will, but it's your weakness which makes you superior. How else would you know what lemon as if you have never been dead? Rose said while placing her strong, labored hands on Champion's tense shoulder as he griped ungratefully. You gotta bring your negative thoughts into captivity. To the obedience of Christ. Her words of wisdom not only extended to the slaves, but she encouraged her daughters Lorraine often be single-minded and obeying in the face of hardship, for the Lord loves consistency, stability, and persistency. Despite Rose's wisdom on the plantation, Mrs. Amrovich and Valentina, the missus of the house, and her daughter berated Rose for her superstitions and denigrated Lorraine, who held the role as part-time wet nurse, often calling her uneducated as she, if she had a choice. Mr. Amrovitz saw Rose's superstitions as unsettling, calling them old wives' tales for invoking and doing intercessions of her ancestors, fearing that she would use the African-based healing practices to harm his family and his business. He could not wait for her to die, believing having no verifiable evidence she was a member of an occult. It is important that the reader knows that I have yet to introduce our our hero, Julian, into the story because they are yet to be born into the realm of human beings. But it wasn't too long after Lorraine returned to her master that Mr. Aronovich began to express his affection for her in the best way slave masters know how, of course. <laughs> 1843, Julian is born. Yes, child. <laughs> I ain't know if he was trying to fuck me or erase me <laughs> with all that rub. Daniel caught world burn, <laughs> Lorraine said, slapping her knee. Then she leaned on that knee to prevent the weight of her pregnant belly from tilting her over. <laughs> this caused the other two females, Sheila and Renee, to hoot and holler in laughter. <laughs> Lorraine was in the middle of telling the women what happened to her by Mr. Amrovich and of his penis size. The women went on chattering and gossiping, poking fun by emasculating the white men they were forced to have sex with, joking about their penis sizes and how some would request to have their anus licked. It bees like feeding a jelly bag to a well. <laughs> and I ain't talking about the blowhole, <laughs> Renee said jokingly. This was followed by another hoot and holler. Fortunately for Julian, slavery was loosening after the 1840s, though the economy still depended on an agri agrarian labor force. However, there came for every gal born to be property that blight, that penetrates deep within her undeveloped uterus and waits on every gal born to be chattel because white slave owners imposed themselves on and abused their female wenches, and it created a large population of mulattoes that sprang from an admixture of African and European forebearers. Lorraine gave birth a month later after nearly inducing a miscarriage with Julian. 
she was tempted to commit infanticide on her unborn child. Far from being a common white male crime, Mr. Aronovich, who considered himself a clever yet benevolent OBGYN obstetrician gynecologist, would rip the mother's womb open and extract the fetus in hopes of de depriving it of life as a retribution for some mysterious infraction done on the mother's part. But infanticide was considered a feminine crime, and Lorraine considered the le relegation of her femininity, though restricted. However, childbirth was irrefutably, despite the social politics surrounding women's reproductive organs, a sacred duty in the fulfillment of some elusive providence that nevertheless applied to her. <laughs> Lorraine did have some enjoyment with baby Julian, <laughs> but it was usually clouded by dark memories of his conception. Rose, when Lorraine was pregnant with Julian, prophesied that she was giving birth to a feminine child with ambiguous genitalia. He's a special child, Rose prophesied to Lorraine. The night before I gave birth, before, the night before you gave birth, she explained, I had a dream that the unborn spiritual forces in the sacred ancestral memory was inside your womb, a creation upon his birth. Rose always implored Lorraine to live life honestly and always do what is right, even as she received a lashing for doing it the whole time. Half an attempt showed integrity and aligned with the teachings of the ancestor of my art, according to Rose. You got a divine child and you's better not let him know, not knowing himself be the biggest challenge because you has got the power to free him, Rose implored to Lorraine. Rose went on to tell Lorraine that she or he, meaning Julian, would grow old and be famous. <clears throat> we know not what we become. Therefore, we must set our hopes on the future. And this gives us strength in our present. Rose spoke with wisdom, placing a tender hand on Lorraine's chin. You just got to give your special child hope so that they have power to control the destiny and go beyond our present condition. But you must have the faith and not grow weary, Rose said to a terrified pregnant Lorraine. Other than being the wet nurse, Lorraine also worked as the seamstress and oversaw making the slaves clothes. Lorraine was the first pregnant when she was first pregnant at age 14 with her master's child, but she left, she self-induced an abortion by ingesting some herbs given to her by Rose that caused trauma to the uterus. Mr. Aramovich was not aware of this and was deeply saddened, but he was thrilled Lorraine carried Julian full term, but he might have well been considered a speck of salt in the sea. Lorraine never expected Mr. Aramovich to claim the illegitimate child he cursed. Unfortunately, Lorraine sustained Mrs. Aramovich's bitter railing and would rather slit her wrist than try to prove to a jealous spouse she hated every second she was forced upon by a husband she holds in such high esteem. As I mentioned, Rose practically raised her missus when Mrs. Aramovich first arrived on the plantation, a backstory I will explain later in the story. Rose took Mrs. Aramovich under her wing, but when her and Mr. Aramovich became married, she started deriding Rose, blaming her for her husband constantly pilot, pollinating Rose's petals. Rose even nursed their two children, Valentina and Bartholomew, despite enduring taboos of breastfeeding being only a white thing. Mrs. Aramovich simply did not have the vigor for that kind of labor. So she very much approved of enforced wet nursing as being an integral benefit of the otherwise detestable institutional slavery pretext. In her defense, Mrs. Aramovich was pleased to be pregnant with Valentina and Bartholomew, feeling she was fulfilling her appropriate duties to Providence, but she left the breastfeeding to a lactating Rose, being that she was always with milk, being always pregnant, but would mysteriously miscarry before reaching the first trimester or even before delivery. <laughs> Mr. Aramovich felt the slaves were too feeble for Lorraine's womb after her second miscarriage, so he donated his sperm to the Bank of Illegitimates as a benefit to the dark race. In truth, Mr. Aramovich was in love with Lorraine, and that is why he did not allow her to give birth by another man. But when she and Champion started courting, Mr. Aramovich made no fuss, seeing Champion too valuable to sell. Mr. Aramovich eventually became jealous, and this motivated him leasing her off to keep her from giving her love away. Giving birth to Lorraine was the only time she or any woman was touched with kindness, dignity, or concern. Lorraine was strong, 
had strong nerves and could tolerate being whipped and raped at the same time and still be up before daybreak, daybreak to prepare her old master's breakfast before he awoke as he complained of nearly throwing his shoulder out as the blood trickled down Lorraine's leg and back. Mr. Aronovich had neither zest nor pizzazz for capital punishment, having lost his whipping vigor. Then his health worsened, so he hired a constable to whip unruly slaves like Tendai, who got it the worst. Mr. Amorovich hated performing the act himself due to his fragile joints caused by his arthritis. Two years after Julian was born, Lorraine gave birth to a baby boy named Shepard. Shepard is the biological son of Champion, who therefore thereafter became Lorraine's fiance. Lorraine could never forget the day of her delivery with Shepard, having her mother Rose there by her side, standing over her, dampening her with a cool towel. You's gotta walk this water like it's concrete. Rose encouraged, just call yourself a water walker. Rose encouraged Lorraine while chuckling a hearty laugh that would make the youngest slave girl forget about her birthing pains. You gotta push, Rose said. I see you blessing crowning. You gotta push your baby crowning. You gotta push. Champion being a skilled craftsman built things from scratch that actually lasted longer than the handiwork of the white servants who did things poorly and only lasted longer than what it would take if the Appalachian Mountain suddenly collapsed before repairs needed. Being a tenacious, outspoken, robust man of good health and vigor, Champion was favored by Mr. Aronovich for working with such alacrity and untiring zeal, so he allowed Lorraine to be pregnant by him as a charge to Champion's manhood for whatever it was worth. Champion being biracial, had a light complexion and was intellectual, though he could not read or write. He had impeccable memory and retained what he read to him and retained what was read to him. However, Julian would not look to him as a father figure, though he believed Champion to be his biological father. Champion would never restore to in Julian's strength of courage, chastened by lack of virility, nor power, weakened by placid obedience. So that is the be sort of the beginning of him growing up and how he saw his who he thought was his father champion, who was not his father. Uh and I guess I'll continue on. So Julia is five years old right now. And I just want to give you like a little bit of back of his childhood. So I'm just going to make this a sequence. Uh, this is now 1848, Julian's identity formation. Julian is age five. <laughs> oh, Lord, it be. <laughs> the good Lord done brought us back home safe and sound, <laughs> Rose said into the slave shack. Beaming with emotions, feeling relieved of her emotional stress the entire year, Mr. Amorovich had been off to war, providing medical support to wounded soldiers in the Mexican-American conflict. Rose gathered the fabric of her frock and ran toward the mansion, heading toward Mr. Amorovich's carriage that had just arrived. The rain trailed behind lethargically, tying her dusty head rag neatly on her head to cover her kinky hair. Julian trailed behind his mother, wearing a sunbonnet, not understanding what the commotion was all about, but he recognized the man exiting the carriage to be his master, who was away for nearly 10 months. Julian had light hazel eyes and curly hair that Mrs. Amrovitz styled by slicking it down using pomade, giving him a glossy appearance in preparation for Mr. Amrovitz's arrival. At the age of five, he had a heart of as free from care instead of any freeborn white child. And when Mr. Amrovich laid eyes on his son, he wanted to kneel down and grab him up in his arms, but stopped shy of the desire, overcoming the temptation not wanting to create jealousy among his siblings, seeing the angry glare in Bartholomew's eyes as he approached his father. Go back in the shack, you niggling. Nobody called you. Bartholomew seized with cruel contempt. You can understand Julian's confusion as he sobbed all the way back to the slave quarters. Bartholomew was often mean to Julian and would show him his children's textbooks, showing him images of blacks being depict depicted as apes and chimpanzees. <coughs> Here, look, <laughs> it's your relatives. <laughs> <laughs> by telling me pointed to the picture in his textbook. My teacher says that mulatto is a byproduct of the orangutan, he teased. 
tossing a book on a stack of books on the floor, then plopping on the bed, putting his hands behind his head and crossing his leg over the other in a reclining position while ordering Julian around. Hey, watch it uh, act like your cousin here. Daily Mew said, forcing Julian to jump up and down and make the sound of a monkey. <laughs> Use the product of your mama fucking an ape. <laughs> Her evolution never better have, <laughs> by Daily Mew said to a naive Julian. This went on until Valentina stormed into the room, deeply disturbed by the noise, but Bartholomew recalcitrantly kept Julian jeering, yelling, and howling like a mad child. To make it worse, he kept knocking him down by tripping him on the floor, then laughing at him. Bartholomew played games with Julian often, even resorting to blackening his face with charcoal. Playing American Indians and cowgirls with a, was his favorite game to play with Julian. Julian was a sagacious and spiritual boy by nature, envious and daydreaming he did often. He would pretend to be Peter Pan and swore that he would never grow up, often living in his fantasies or stargazing. The others saw him as dreamy. Julian was a quiet child and often engaged in solitary activities that the Amoraviches saw as his self-communion to probe the depths of his soul. <laughs> Julian was a kind of mystic, and he felt people's emotions having extrasensory capabilities. His forehead would pulsate when he was around the slaves or any guests who visited the plantation, feeling their energy to be negative. When they all when he had ill intentions. He struggled with his perceptions growing up, which caused others to hate him, including his mother, Lorraine, who rivaled against him. Consequently, Lorraine wished to, Julian wished to take his revenge out on them, becoming cruel to his mother as a result for rejecting him and distinguishing him from the pack, seeing him as racially separate because he was lighter complexion. But Julian never connected this to having a white father because Champion was light-skinned, so he never understood her dislike of him. Mrs. Aronovich wandered the regions in which Julian's thoughts wandered when he was in deep contemplative meditation. <laughs> Leave him alone. He is thinking of the joys of an emancipated existence, Mr. Amorovich remarked. Quite common among those foolish enough to imagine themselves clever enough to outwit the system. <laughs> they are inevitably subdued by self-condemnation or penance. And of course, the ubiquitous guilt of having transgressed some provincial law of nature due to an error in new age beliefs, thanks to the sciences which encourages this disobedience and observance to the mandates, order and command precepts. And finally, the law of nature. Mr. Amrovid said this without pausing to take a breath, nor did his finger stop twirling his brass cane while pointing it at Julian, who was dancing on the front lawn. Outwardly, Julian seemed to embrace the inward treachery of his being, which made the others envious, and Bartholomew was especially condescending to Julian. Look at the little queer on the prairie. <laughs> <laughs> Bartholomew said, taunting Julian to get off the roof of the slave shack. Get down here. I got a job for you. And it requires blowing. <laughs> Bartholomew cackled at his own jocular referral, alluding to a blow job. Mr. Aronbridge often commented on Julian, thinking himself foolish enough to progress, calling Julian's ideals quixotic or foolish pursuits of ideals. And, a dis and he discouraged his wife from tutoring him. Why? him with advantages that will never prove to make him a man, but only alienate him from his rightful life condition and make him estranged to himself and his class. If this is done prematurely, it will only make him ungrateful and, and he forget the mouth that feeds him, but instead bites the hand, Mr. Aramovich argued. Mrs. Aramovich was well more sympathetic and felt very every slave child the, uh, deserved the white teacher to instill in them, as she calls it, the great white hope. <laughs> a kingdom is to be won only by striving, she said to her husband, quoting a proverb from the Bible. Everyone starts somewhere. Better to start from the bottom than the top, or else, or how else will you know how to crawl when momentum of success is tedious and doubtful? She asked reasonably, de defending her right as an educator, but she referred to her husband <clears throat> to have her thoughts affirmed and validated. If Julian is to be better than his people, she continued, feeling her husband contemplative silence was not his way of tuning her out this time. It is best to understand the conditions he is trying to annex. If we offer him too many privileges, he will grow weary of his condition. Having no relief, through the arts, though making man well-rounded, Mr. Amorovich responded arguably. I'm not worried about Julian's 
because nepotism, Faustus, is the truest way to establish lifelong allegiances, she claimed. Then again, he does share kinship, she said, giving her husband a shrewd look. It was true, Julian possessed a lot of his master's ways, having an inordinate amount of pride and self-esteem, and this buoyant disposition was seen by others, particularly the slaves, as personally a personal defect, making the other slaves contend with him. He concedes of the future is already here, Mrs. Amorovitz said of Julian. She meant Julian's thought transcends time and space, making him feel free and already ab abundant, prosperous, and successful, though he was forced to subdue him in himself those traits which wanted to break out and rebel for freedom. Reveal it, my child, <laughs> Mrs. Amorovitz would say with a broad smile as Julian danced all over the yard, exuding boundless pride, making the slaves envious who could not loosen their constraints of practical slavery to allow themselves to get rid of negativity. The slaves envied Julian because they could not break the humdrum of their practical lives of tealing and sewing. Why are you so damn happy? Warner uttered contemptuously. Julian overheard Warner's miserable, puzzling question. Then, after observing the miserableness on the slaves' faces as they watched their them hit with grimaced scorn. <clears throat> it's magical. It's magnetical. It's intentional. Julian sang harmonically, responding theatrically to their curiosity as he said, sashayed off. <laughs> he would always fight for his life as it mocked at his struggle for freedom. His life would operate so not to vanquish him completely. Then again, he wasn't the enemy, <laughs> but the forces controlling his life would keep him restless and distracted while he tries clinging to the dictums of modernism and his form pronouncements. <laughs> Julian was often scolded for climbing the ladder and being on top of the roof without an adult watching. Climb your floating tail off that roof before you break your head, life yelled for Julian to get off the roof of the shack. <clears throat> climbing down don't come natural to him, so his head already cracked. Champion said, appearing around the shack. Champion was jealous of Julian's reading and writing abilities, often complaining to Rain about Julian. He no more deserving of his gift than a bird deserves his wings. <laughs> his gift ain't nothing but his... But his... Ability due to his training by white folks. Lorraine responded enviously, agreeing with her fiancé's statement. <clears throat> But it ain't a blessing to have such a life, while most of us slaves live in darkness and ain't able to even say our ABCs. Let's not write poetry. The boy is gifted, I tell you. But why God chose him is will confound me to my death. He's an uh, illegitimate mud, if you ask me. Carrying around the blood of the enemy and should never be allowed to see the light of day. Champion retorted bitterly, hating the fact Julian was treated as a superior when he too was mixed gen of mixed genetical rape makeup. The other slaves were envious of his dexterity, mental skills, and quickness, and often eyed him with a contaminated look of envy. Julian, however, refused to be a part of that unsullied group of deplorables that accepted their fetters. He was clever and well-read, proceeded past the rules of his tribe, meaning he consorted with and stood in with the more well-to-do, who were his master's family and friends. Julian would emulate Mr. Amrovich's war stories by putting on his military coat and even wore Bartholomew's Navy sailor's cap as a kid. Mrs. Amrovich bought soaps of an expensive quality and Julian would bathe using her soaps, even wearing her lip rouge and Valentina lean and slim heavy silk white or pale colored dresses that she wore when she was Julian's age. He often snuck into Mrs. Aronovich's perfume chest and wore her perfume, familiarizing himself with luxuries while yearning for what that which was above his station. Julian often struggled to discern reality. He cannot believe how in a former life he lived a life of luxury and authority to subsequently go into a black vessel or slave to endure such spiritual and psychological defeat. You act like a UFO, Champion said to Julian, staring at him with a puzzling curiosity. And you act like a UFO, fuck you, <laughs> Julian said under his breath, not wanting to disrespect his father, but for death and life are in the power of the tongue, and the Bible instructs to love and honor thy father, no matter if he gives his child rotten fruits to eat. Thank you for alienating me. Now I'm an alien. Thanks.
<laughs> Julian said in the, <laughs> to the field workers in a drawn out way as he strutted off without a care in the world, heading back to the master's house where he gets to wear master's clothes and sit on the porch with that smug face, knowing all too well the other slaves had it worse worst off and their lives were royally fucked. <laughs> if you gotta step on toes, have the hardest steel toes on, Rose said to Julian, who would run inside crying for being picked on by the field slaves because he wanted to play in the field while they were picking cotton. Rose would wipe the tears from his face and say, speak, put your gang face on and go on back out there and play. You gotta disturb the peace if you can't get no peace. Grandmother Rose was Julian's source of comfort because he came in the house crying often after being bullied by one of the male slaves. Despite the constant harassments, Julian still dared to dream. The sky's the limit, Rose would say to Julian, encouraging his wildest imaginations, daring him to shoot his dreams beyond the skies and see where they land. Thank you very much for listening. Goodbye. <laughs>